10 seconds. Well, I want to welcome all of you back to our series, Stronger America Through Seafood. And of course, many of you have been joining me each week, really the impetus of it, talking about the executive order as well as the impending legislation around both taking, a, taking our fisheries, making them stronger, streamlining processes around aquaculture, and of course, the many dynamic around that as we all try to figure out what we mean through the EO as well as through the pending legislation. And really the impetus for all of this was as we conduct these curiosity conversations, I wanted to learn more. And so whether it was through Margaret Henderson, as we talked about what the bill and the legislation really meant, through to our conversation with Kim Thompson from Aquarium of the Pacific. And then of course, this dialogue now as we go into more of the thought leaders and the stakeholders and we start to look at how are we going to do what we talked about last week with Noah, with Paul and with Michael around how are we gonna make sure that these systems are very well put into place and that all of the voices that want to be able to create not only this dialogue but also the way in which we grow this um, are heard. So joining me today Today, I have two people that I think you're going to find not only fascinating, both of whom you probably have heard of. The first is Todd English. He is the former director of sustainability for River and Trout. He worked there for several years. But what you may not know about Todd is that he has crafted climate change mitigation strategies, sustainable business initiatives, and employment employee environmental education programs for several Fortune 500 companies, whether it's the Gap, Gap Inc., American Electric Power, the National Restaurant Association. He has been a voice in creating solutions in exactly this same way that we have wanted to discuss. And then the other person that's joining me is Josh Bones Murphy. He is a director and producer of films that include The River Y, which won the ASC Best Cinematography 2010 Ashland Independent Award, Here Alone, which was the winner of Best Narrative for Tri Tribeca 2016. And of course, many of you will know him from Patagonia's film Artificial, which was commissioned by Patagonia founder Yvonne Chouinard, and of course was also premiered and released at Tribeca 2019 and has been viewed over two, th two million times worldwide before being released on Amazon Prime, iTunes, YouTube, and has won a number of environmental film festival awards. And of course, I'm Jennifer Bushman, and I join you as this seafood champion, an ethical aquaculturist, a strategist, and a water farmer champion. And I do want us to dive in because I can tell you right now that, let me tell you that an hour is not gonna be a long enough with Todd and Josh, because there are a lot of things about this in terms of the development of this category that I think is so incredibly interesting from their side and their perspective. And so I wanted to dive in because I know that the two of you, your connection is as anglers, of course, in your professional life, you've lived lives um, giving conversation, thinking about both raised and wild caught food and what those intersects are and what some of those issues have been. So first, I'd like, Todd, for you to tell me a little bit about your journey, your love of fish, and then we'll hand it over to Josh because those stories are legendary about the two of you out on the boat fishing together and talking about how you might amplify some of these issues and ultimately where you, your careers led you. Thanks, Jennifer. Uh, thanks for having us and uh, Hatch Blue for inviting us uh, on this webinar. Um, as Jen mentioned, my name is Todd English. I am uh, a passionate fisherman, to say the least. My background um, largely stems from growing up in the Northwest, fishing for salmon um, in very uh, you know small rivers and river systems and recognizing the change over time. When I was a kid, there seemed to be a lot of salmon as I grew older. Um, passionate about fly fishing for steelhead. Uh, I, I had a uh, sort of an epiphany when I hit my 20s that the, the, the fisheries are in serious decline. And these were rivers that were not impeded by dams. These were changing ocean conditions, overfishing, habitat degradation. 
And uh, so it really kind of set my life course on being passionate for wild fisheries. Um, but in general, just a passion for the environment. I uh, recently started, well, a de over a decade ago, started a company to really help uh, leverage the financial um, markets here in, in California around climate change to benefit um, a reduction, a serious reduction in greenhouse gases. We then transitioned into um, looking into um, differentiating commodities based on their environmental impact so that we can now um, assess whether one commodity is um, better for the environment than the other. Um, and then I decided to leave the company just after 10, 12 years. You kind of just need to move on sometimes. And so um, I ended up uh, working with Riverence Trout Company based in Idaho, and they are a land-based sustainable operation. Um, and I was their director of sustainability in charge of sustainability initiatives and uh, sales and communications of the value and brand of what the, the value and message of what Riverence is to the, uh, to the seafood community. Incredible. And of course, all stemming from that passion for fish. And Bones, tell me a little bit about your background, how you came to this, because I think that this is one of those things like with Todd, that is a little bit unknown that you had all of this background in education before you ever made artificial. Yes. And thank you for having me and for Hatch Blue and for Zoom for allowing me to have a, a, a place to play in this while driving back from dropping my daughter off at camp. So hence the, uh, the wonderful interior of the audio auto behind me. Uh, my, when I was growing up, my, my idol was Jacques Cousteau. And I'm sure many people share a similar affinity for the films that he made. And at the time, I didn't recognize him as a filmmaker. I thought of him as an explorer. And I wanted to be an explorer. And I grew up around water all the time and fishing. And I went to school for natural resources and fisheries and wildlife biologies at the University of Vermont to specifically try to train to do what I thought Cousteau did and then realized that there was a lot more to it. And uh, then I went to Humboldt State University where I earned a graduate degree in fisheries biology. And the summer beforehand, I worked in Ireland on a Danish-owned, Irish-operated trout farm. And then while, during, I should say, while I was uh, a graduate student, I paid for my graduate degree by managing the on-campus hatchery at Humboldt State University. So I started to see this idea of raising and rearing fish as something pretty commonplace and thought there was something we should really do more of. Uh, then my idea of that kind of changed. And I'd been watching for years, as Todd had mentioned, just kind of the de decline of wild fish. I read a book uh, that my good friend Carl Safina wrote called Songs for the Blue Ocean, which is about the worldwide depletion of wild fish populations. And it it made me ask a lot of questions and serendipitous, serendipitously met Yvonne Schnard again. We've been a number of times and he mentioned that he was working on a film, which he called about the arrogance of man, which I thought was kind of a topic, but it was specifically about how we were unwilding salmon and steelhead and trout and other fish by raising them and how once we lose wild, we've lost the basis of the thing that we fell in love with initially. And, it set me off on this path to make this film artificial, which has dramatically changed my viewpoint on the role of both wild systems and hatchery slash fish farm systems. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's kind of the crux of everything that we want to talk about today. We have an amazing dialogue that we want to build from that's based around this. And I think that that's one of the things that is most important about, as we talked about, about this EO and this impending legislation and really giving everyone a sense of it. So it's so we're going to take questions at the end. I want to make sure that everybody knows. But I want to start off by talking a little bit about this, because, as you know, there's there is a lobbying group called Stronger America Through Seafood. And what it is, is it's immediate focus at the federal level to have a two pronged approach to initiate change. So the first one is through the passage of bipartisan advancing the quality and understanding of American aquaculture. It's called the Aqua Act. It's H.R. 6. 191. And then the second is through executive action. So it, the branch being able to really push forward efficiency of existing aquaculture regulations. 
And in this order, and I know that you probably both, it was passed, um, it was assigned on May 7th, it opens up talking about really the strengthening of these systems. Um, you know, America needs a vibrant and competitive seafood industry. You, you both know this, 90% of our fish and seafood is imported. It means that it unfairly cannot compete with um, products that are brought in, our American fishers and our aquaculture, and that there needed to be effective permitting related both to offshore aquaculture as well as streamlining fishery regulation. And so I wanted Todd to ask you first, because Riverance has had this role in sustainable aquaculture. And as you have moved on, what I wanted to know was what learnings did you leave with in terms of the role that sustainable aquaculture plays in tandem with well-managed fisheries that means that we could bring more American fish and seafood to our plates? Yeah, well, first of all, I'd like to state that I am an advocate for both wild and farm-raised fish, uh, responsible uh, farm-raised fish. I mean, our wild fisheries, for the most part, can no longer support an increase in fishing pressure. So we are, you know, in effect, sort of maxed out with what we can produce. Um, you know, any additional near-term growth in seafood is likely to come from aquaculture. It's just going to have to. Um, so it can play a significant role in the, you know, recovery or destruction of wild fish. It's a, it's a, it's a, you know, a, a topic that has been discussed, uh, at length. Um, and I'll explain a little bit more about that, um, in just a little bit, but I think, you know, in essence, aquaculture has supported wild fisheries during, um, you know, shifts in production due to seasonality. Um, it has played an important role, um, in, um, supplying us with seafood when catch rates are low. Look at what's happening at Copper River right now. I mean, they're closing that down and um, where are we going to get our seafood? You know, if we don't have wild seafood to support the demand um, in the U.S., it's going to have to be from aquaculture or it's going to have to be imported. Mm -hmm. So currently 50, about 50% 50 of our imported fish is from farm-raised sources. Uh, why can't we produce that here? Uh, can we do so in an environmentally sustainable way? Um, I believe that we can. Um, but if we can develop um, uh, sustainable aquaculture uh, within the U.S., we can rely on less on we can rely less on imports, which has ancillary benefits like, you know, greenhouse gas reduction, uh, increased jobs, security. I mean, when I first started with Rib Riverance, I'll have to say that um, I was quite skeptical on aquaculture. Uh, because of my background, my passion for wild, I didn't, uh, like many people have, have thought, I didn't believe that aquaculture could be that panacea to help us uh, fill in where the wild fish are. But it didn't take long sort of for me to learn from some of the world's experts at Riverance. I mean, there were some incredible people that I got to work with in new animal nutrition and in feed um, and in um, uh, aquaculture, um, farming practices, medicines, and things of that sort. I mean, I got to learn from some of the world's best, and it really changed my perspective on, on aquaculture. Um, you know, I feel, I feel we can achieve uh, sustainability through, you know, in aquaculture through uh, scientific understanding of aquaculture's effects on ecosystems uh, in conjunction with innovations, new technologies, around water treatment, feed sources and medicine. Uh, but we all have, I believe it has to be done with an eye towards uh, preserving wild fish in our ecosystems. That's an, incre an incredible exactly. component. Mm -hmm. of and and how we have to look at this. There's a quote actually Bones that you said where you said that fish has to be recognized as wildlife. And so I wonder if you can talk to me a little bit about, you You know, obviously in the film, I think what a lot of people don't know is that there was an aquaculture component at Riverance that was left on the cutting room floor. There was a further conversation. You've come out saying that you also believe in, in aquaculture, but it obviously has to be aquaculture done right. And what I want to talk to you about, and I know Todd's going to have some, um, some, uh, uh, 
conversation about this as well, something to say about this as well, is that it needs to come through greater regulation. You spoke specifically about thinking that it was a promising sector, but it has to be that increase can't come at the demand uh, or that demand can't come at the, you know, the risk of losing our wild fish. And one of the things that you talked about specifically that I'd love to hear about is what is that from your perspective and what do we need to do in order to assure that? Because you talked about some um, ways in which you think that that can happen. Yeah, and I will say as well that I think that aquaculture has some promise if we can decouple the food system from wild sources. Mm -hmm. I think that aquaculture has promise from investment standpoint, but I also wonder who's investing in wild. Because what I see right now is that we've collapsed the world fisheries. We've overfished them due to deregulation, habitat loss, and the like. And that's created business opportunities. And people now are saying, hey, we need less regulation to make more business opportunities. But I don't know of any one specific example of a place where aquaculture has, in fact, saved wild fish. Because what happens is our consumption of wild fish continues at a similar rate. And then the consumption of aquaculture rises. And so that's a result of our impact on wild fisheries to some extent. That said, that's where we are today. And so now we have to say, are we going to continue to uh, endorse certain forms of aquaculture that have deleterious effects on wild fish, like open net pen that has escapes, has uh, pollution issues, has a number of varieties of, of, of uh, permitting problems that allow certain businesses to basically impact the people's wild fish for the profit of the company. And yeah. so I think we have to kind of say, how, how, do we, how do we invest in the protection of wild for the future while also investing in sustainable technologies of aquaculture that don't further degrade wild fish? And that's, I think, exactly what the hope is here, is that we get ahead of what those regulations potentially can be, and that we become stakeholders in this conversation with NOAA with exactly that same kind of lens. And I wanted you both to talk about what you think one of the solutions would be, because you spoke to me about the opportunity of something, for example, like a carbon offset program. So I'd love for both of you to discuss what you think that might look like, because, and Josh, I'd like to start with you, because because you talked about how essentially a farmer on land has so many more fees, regulations, um, you know, whether it's buying the land, whether it's getting certified than we do when we get our concessions on water. And how is it that we can kind of prop up that system so that we can have offsets go to also protecting wild stocks? Give us your vision about that, because that's very compelling to me. Yeah, it's the, the, the concept that that I've kind of envisioned was what I think of as wild offsets, which is that if we're going to invest in aquaculture technologies, then we should also have some benefit going to the protection of wild systems because wild systems have an amazing opportunity to make up deficits when well treated because wild systems have inherently less energy input to make what we gain on the back end. But nobody invests in that because of the tragedy of the commons where you invest in in wild systems and then somebody else comes in and scoops it up and takes it out. There's no control of that. But there is, in fact, models for this already in place. And if we look at what's been done with, for example, waterfowl with refuge systems, that's allowed investment in wild, but really through the state-run level. That's from bird stamps or duck stamps, etc. And there's from habitat uh, protections and less harvest. And that's allowed waterfowl populations to soar beyond which we've seen in the since the early part of the 1900s when they were horribly over over hunted as well as uh, habitat from water um, wetlands etc filled in so could we use some idea of a refuge system that's supported by private industry that says if you're going to develop something that encourages aquaculture can we also not have some benefit that goes to wild systems mm -hmm. and whether that becomes MPAs whether that becomes stronghold rivers, whether that becomes additional habitat places. I mean, we, we see in this new executive order that they're opening up marine protected areas for fishing, which to me is ridiculous because we're all, we're saying let's increase aquaculture and also let's go fish in the rookery areas, the, the basic areas we've defined as being beneficial to wild fish at the same time. Mm -hmm. That is a net negative for the future, in my opinion. Yeah, and I think that one of the things that was a, a concern for everyone was that it was a very general kind of wide swath 
in those seven pages versus what the details were in the bill. But more importantly, and I think everyone that's been a part of sustainable, ethical aquaculture wants to make sure that the right people again are at the table. And from from Noah's perspective last week, it didn't sound like anybody wanted to rush to get these licenses approved and get them into the water. It was more that what it did was it was to streamline a process to get all the right people at the table. So to your point, our responsibility at this point is to make sure that all of those voices are in the room so that when a company is looking at, because funding is a big issue, aquaculture and funding in the United States, because there wasn't a clear permitting process, has been something that really has been very costly and has taken away some of that more progressive money as we've seen other organizations really grow sustainable aquaculture with more support. And Todd, I wanna to talk to you about this in terms of the work that you were doing and the way in which that could potentially work with carbon offsets. Well, let me back up just for a quick second. I can talk about market-based mechanisms. Um, I've got quite a bit of experience in that space. Um, they are successful when they're implemented correctly. Um, being able to invest in wild, I think, is a, is a great idea. Um, there's a lot of innovations that need to happen in aquaculture in conjunction with jumping on a market-based system. I think one of the biggest impact aquaculture can have is talking about feed. Um, a lot of feed today is sourced from wild sourced uh, fisheries. And uh, essentially we're fishing down the trophic levels to be able to support something that nature needs to be able to recover. And so there needs to be a lot of movement, forward movement in the aquaculture space to um, utilize the new technologies such as algae oil or um, soldier fly larvae meal or um, many different types of you know, hydrolyzed proteins. I mean, there's, there's all kinds of ways that we can begin to shift our use of wild fish in aquaculture feed towards these new technologies uh, that will effectively, hopefully leave some of these fish in the ocean so that uh, wild fisheries can, can recover. Uh, so there's a lot of advancements in aquaculture. Waste capture and reuse, I think is really important um, to consider. Uh, hard to do with net pens, but a lot easier, but at a higher cost in land-based systems. Um, so there's a number of things that need to happen in aquaculture before we think about, are there market-based mechanisms in that we can put in place to be able to, um, to invest in wild? I think there's a lot of, a lot of work we can do in innovations um, already, uh, but I think a market-based innovation might be a, a, a good solution further down the road. If you think about the California Air Resources Board has put in the cap and trade system here in California, which I operated my last company under. And uh, it's been a very successful program at reducing greenhouse gases. And there can be, I believe, a system that invests in wild. Mm -hmm. No, I, I and I think that this is one of when we talked about this last week, I think it is one of the key components that could be added and is missing. And when Bones, when you brought up the fact that there really isn't a mechanism for that, that if we're going to take something away from wild, and maybe it is that real estate, we've got to be giving and putting something back. And when we look at these investments, which are, you know, multi, multi million dollar investments and systems, I say, you're, you're either going to be a fish farmer or a wine producer, like who wants to make those bets, right? You know, over several years investment, Todd, you and I both know that those feed models are in place and happening now. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that, um, you know, Noah has said is that those feed models are those sustainable feed models are going to have to be put into place on these farms. So how are we making sure as stakeholders that the feed model check of the box happens? Right. So, I mean, because that's something that, you know, I've been involved in for over a decade and there isn't a single reason why we can't move that faster. Hatch Blue investing in better technology, whether it's Title X or others that are going to use different AI systems to make sure that we don't have that waste or that overuse. Things that we can really, I personally think, if we can do what Barton Seaver says, which is we're developing a new food system, then all of us as stakeholders can put that stake in the ground and say, this is how we want to build it together. Now, Bones, I want to ask you about something because you talked about in the article for um, Oceanographic that you wrote, you said, it's my hope that artificial exposes the status quo for what it is. 
the commoditization of rivers and fish rather than recognition of fish as wildlife. It is also hope it begins a greater conversation about the future of wild fish and leaves the viewers wrestling with a disquieting question, have we reached the end of wild? So I guess the, the question I would ask you right now is, is this the end of wild? Um, or are there answers beyond our current thinking, like you've already talked about, where that voice can then impact what ultimately this bill wants, which is to create more domestic seafood, wild and farmed in a sustainable way? Well, I think that question has to be answered by all of us. How much do we want wild? And how much is that important to us still? And perhaps it's not anymore. And if so, uh, that's hugely damaging to me personally, because I think that when we lose wild systems, by the way, wild fish are the single last thing that we eat at scale that is still wild. There's no other system that we're eating at scale that comes from wild systems. No other protein, I should say. And so when you look at that, there's literally billions of people being fed by wild fish daily around the world. Their only form of protein is wild fish. If we think we're going to farm solutions for those billions of people, I think we're fooling ourselves. I think we have to say, how do we meet demand for certain species in certain countries of perhaps cultured fish? But how do we also then say, we have to protect these things because they are a part of integral ecosystems that perform functions that are beyond just for the benefit of humans. Humans continue to believe that this is basically a breadbasket that we are supposed to pluck from to feed ourselves, but we do so at our own risk. And we've seen that time and again. And so I keep coming back to this idea that we have to first appreciate what wild means. For example, there, is, there are more protections on what an organic tomato is today than what a wild fish is. Congress has not said what wild is legally, mm -hmm. but we've said clearly what organic is. And so I come back to saying, how much do we value wild? We value wild eagles, we value elk, we value deer, we value seabirds but fish seem to be just a commodity that we want to eat. Yeah, and I don't disagree with you. I mean, I can remember the first time that I ever heard Noah speaking about salmon um, and what the fishers were catching and called it production levels. And, it sa and, I'm, and I'm coming from the ethical aquaculture side, and that's what we talk about when we're talking about production on the farm. So Todd, I think that this idea, um, one, you were living in this ecosystem at Riverance where you know, David E. Kelly said to me and to a number of others in the room at Aquarium of the Pacific, I feel that as the wild fish go, we go. And that, that, that we have got to respect and protect these ecosystems. Now, one of the things that Josh reminded me of was the conversation that he and I first had about the protection around rivers, which there are even more protections in the Magnuson-Stevenson Act than there are specifically about riverways. So I still come back to this as an optimist, as an ethical aquaculture champion, as an ocean-raised um, farmed uh, fish champion, that in, in the highest sustainability level, it can solve these problems, right? With the way that investment is coming, with the importance of the food system. And I, and I wonder, Todd, if you can talk to me about, because it's not all going to be land-based aquaculture. It's going to be a combined solution. It's going to be ocean-raised, land-based, wild, and probably the combination and overlay of carbon footprint, frozen and fresh, right? All coming to the, staying within the United States to bring more access, more food justice around the consumption of fish and seafood. That's, I mean, and, and, and for you as well, coming from that lens of land-based, tell me about that. So um, you're right in saying that there's going to have to be a solution that includes land-based and uh, ocean uh, farming. Uh, right now, uh, we've got a number of uh, large RAS salmon systems being developed, uh, Atlantic Sapphire, Aquacon, um, a number of others, Superior Fresh out of uh, Wisconsin, um, utilizing you know, land-based um, uh, systems. Most of that investment is coming from foreign sources. Um, we're seeing with this with this this bill in Congress and the executive order, what it does it set up that sets up that framework so it gives investors in the United States confidence that there's going to be regulatory environment around aquaculture that will support a system to be able to develop um, aquaculture here in the United States. 
I think we're going to see a significant shift in investment into, you know, an investor class here in the United States, uh, which I'm excited to see. Um, but we, you know, as we, as many others on these webinars that I've seen have talked about, you know, we have to do this um, very carefully. I know these, uh, the bill and the executive order just open up the framework, but then you've got NOAA that's going to have an office that's going to manage uh, information from NGOs, stakeholders, uh, producers, and develop a system that is hopefully going to be, you know, a very sustainable um, and protect wild fish. Mm -hmm. That's exactly right. And hopefully there's a lot of people that have to room in an effort to make that happen. And one of the things that I, that I wanted to ask you about was the idea that those standards have to be better that we have to be better than where the ASC standard is at this point. We need to be better than where the Seafood Watch Green is. Like, how do we how do we push that forward beyond just the technology side to motivate these companies to do so? Well, I think you have to get various stakeholders involved um, and really look at what are best practices. You've also got the Global Aquaculture Alliance and their subsidiary BAP, Best Aquaculture Practices. They're also making significant changes that are beneficial. I think it was. 10 days ago or last week, they just released their new standards for feed mills, which requires 75% uh, of the wild fish sourced in feed to be from um, certified sources, uh, effective immediately for salmon farmers and subsequent um, farmers in a, in a year's time. Mm -hmm. We're going to have to look to organizations like that to help guide guide us. Uh, it's going to be a stakeholder process. Uh, I don't really fully understand the political environment that we're going to have to be in to be able to get this information um, you know, to this organization. We are going to have to listen to scientists. We are going to have to understand that um, you know, what they bring to the table is really, really important to help develop a sustainable aquaculture system here in the United States. Mm -hmm. That's exactly that. I, I think that that's the whole thing is that collaboration and really listening to one another. Josh, do you feel like we have to have a different American aquaculture standard to be able to do this the right way? Well, yeah, I think we have to we have to align our values with what we want for the future. I mean, if, if we're just talking about making economic gains and jobs at the expense of the environment, then I think we have to rethink that. Yes, we all do need jobs, but we also need a sustainable future. Mm -hmm. And so if the aquaculture industry on the whole can progress to a point where it's not further degrading wild fisheries and is actually doing what many people have said they intended in the outset, which was to take the pressure off that, then I think there's benefit. And there's benefit to consumers at that point. There's benefits to the environment. And that's what we have to consider. But that is a value aligned judgment that needs to be provided to people that they understand what's happening. And I think that's the biggest problem is consumers don't quite understand. Yeah. And that's the interesting thing too, which is, is part of what you do. I mean, putting that kind of content out into the public. And I think a lot of this, you know, kind of churning up the waters to be able to create dialogue was what the film did, right? That was the whole idea is that yeah. the, the, these were conversations that we haven't been having. And I don't know of another, another entity other than, for example, Patagonia that would have invested the time and effort it took to tell a story like this. Mm -hmm. But I think hopefully that that then leads to policy discussion. Well, and I think, and I think already, and I think that's Value discussions of for Todd and I, you know, as we go out fishing for Sam, yeah, I was Todd and I go out fishing for salmon. We're we're left fishing for hatchery salmon only because we don't have a choice as a consumer. There's no, there's almost no wild left, and in California they don't even mark the fish that are wild or hatchery raised. So as consumers, we have no choice in it, and that should change. We should be able to say, hey, excuse me, that's not acceptable, and we would like to propose new policy changes at that level. We've, I mean, I I don't disagree with you because when you're working in. Um, salmon, if we're going to use that one, and salmon's the one that either has been good to us or gets us into trouble. I mean, let's let's face it, you know, I mean, the good and the bad, you can farm chicken well, and you can farm chicken badly. And salmon certainly has put us into those waters. But what I think is really interesting is that, you know, we can, we can make choices, better choices, and maybe in fact, be able to say, this is maybe not part of this ecosystem. Does it have to be salmon? Can it be other species? I mean, we have great, we have great um, regenerative aquaculture systems that also will benefit from this. Seaweed, oysters, those systems also that could really do, have great impact, in fact. Um, in some of these water systems. We're getting questions. I want to take some questions from you. Jennifer Fortier asks this, 
How can NetPen, RAS, and other aquaculture producers work together to promote all aquaculture? Should we focus on consumer education and choice or overall nutrition benefits and environmental impact? Which I think, Josh, we were just saying, we've got to have education out there around this so that we're adopting both wild and farmed, right? It can't just be you only eat the wild. Yeah, and I, I think I'll throw this to, to Todd because he thought very hard on this as well. But his point when we were talking was, has aquaculture actually earned a social contract with consumers right now? Because many consumers say, is this farmed or is this wild? And if it's farmed, they think it's worse. And in many cases, it likely may be, not all cases. But if it's wild, it may be overfishing the last of the wild fish in a system, especially when we're fishing in open ocean where there's mixed stock. So there's individual fish, we'll say salmon at this point, that are returning to individual rivers, but we're catching them in the ocean. We don't know where they're going. It could be the last wild salmon that's returning to one river that we catch in the middle of the ocean. So I think that there has to be consideration uh, and education of the consumer to say, what do you believe in and what's important? But I think, again, I'll, I'll throw that to, to, to Todd because he knows the other systems much better as well. Well, and Todd, I just want to say it was really fascinating to me. And we knew this in the entire time that I was w working in ethical aquaculture, aquaculture at the highest level, that those hatcheries, state run and public, often aren't up to the same um, considerations that we have to be in order to be able to be Seafood Watch compliant or to ASC or BAP. So it's so that's the other thing too is we're investing in all of this on the sustainable aquaculture side in our hatchery systems, but then there are a lot of them that somehow skip out of that regula re those regulations. So I'm so yes to to Bones' point. What um you know tell us about that in terms of social license and how people feel and how we change that narrative. Yeah, that's a that's a real good one and. Uh... Over the last couple of years, I worked a lot with chefs and, and restaurants and distributors, uh, retail. Uh, they all seem to be able to understand the value and the benefit of what aquaculture brings, um, the good and the bad, let's just call it that. Um, but there's also uh, a, a, an educational component that Bones mentioned, I think with the consumer, um, the general public, um, I don't think aquaculture has fully earned a social license yet. I think it's gonna take some time to uh, work with organizations, uh, the good work that uh, Seafood Nutrition Partnership is doing. Um, mm -hmm. And there are a lot of great chefs out there that have been championing uh, good aquaculture. And it's really helping uh, getting all of aquaculture working together to help educate the consumers and let them make the decision. Mm -hmm. Yes. And so that it's interesting because we got a, um, a question about that in terms of just, is it, do we need that larger campaign? But to, I think all of both of your point, are we ready? I think, let me jump in real quick. I think one of the things that we, we need to do here in America, I mean, we all know that seafood, the nutritional benefits that seafood brings is, is uh, unparalleled uh, when it comes to uh, proteins from DHA and EPA, the omega threes, good for your brain, good for your heart, good for your circulatory system. I mean, the benefits of that are just incredible. Um, but we don't, I don't feel, I mean, our per capita uh, seafood consumption here in the United States is just extremely low. And whether what I learned from consumers out there was that um, one, seafood's expensive. So through aquaculture, we need to, uh, local domestic aquaculture, we need to find a way to bring the prices down. Um, but also um, um, the, uh, just, sorry, my train of thought just got thrown away. Um, anyway, um, we need to educate consumers on uh, getting to them to eat more seafood um, and really embrace the health benefits of, of good seafood. Um, and if, until we really get Americans starting to eat seafood, it's, 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 uh, it's gonna be an education thing that we have to get out there and, and really help people understand yeah, and, those, and those chefs I feel like we're really only uh, even after 10 years it's one of those things where you still were finding just those handful of examples that are farms that those chefs really feel like they can stand behind with all of the transparency things like blockchain to your point that intersect of technology on all elements of the system we have another question um, from impact nine that asks aquaculture concerns on energy input 
wild stock impacts and livestock welfare issues have been raised. Where do you both think that these are better addressed with respect to RAS versus open ocean production? Uh, I will, I'll take that one to start out. I would actually just kind of go backwards one and, and say that the education is paramount because I don't think that in the United States, there's enough uh, consumption of seafood to begin with. I mean, if you look at like a really fun story is the Catholic belief of eating fish on Friday was to invigorate a market for fish in Italy. That was done by the church to say, we need to eat more fish. The United States is still a meat and potatoes country. Absolutely. And so to invigorate markets, we actually have to, we have to inform the consumer so they want it. But going to the question specifically, there are big questions of ethical treatment of animals. There are big questions in where the systems are that support the raising of fish. For example, RAS, uh, which is recirculating, oftentimes land-based, can be ocean-based, but they are able to capture all of the input and output like you would in a municipal wastewater system versus open ocean where everything that goes in comes out. And so my point of view is uh, we don't let many people pollute without consequence. And if aquaculture cannot police itself for its pollution, then there's a problem. And so is there a way to, uh, to, to farm ocean, open ocean aquaculture with little pollution? Perhaps. Mm -hmm. Is there a way to do it on land? Very much so, but it's more costly. And right. so we have to weigh those back and forth because it, it is a cost benefit analysis. Absolutely. And I think that when you talk about these offsets and investment, this is definitely as again, we're growing this system. It's an incredible way in which to put something back into the system and be able to make sure that maybe those developments are being um, done right and those things are being explored. Stephen, yeah, now, let, what, one other quick question or one caveat I would say is that oftentimes we're defaulting to fin fish, right? As opposed to non feed input like oysters, clams, right. seaweed. One of my best friends runs a, a hatchery for oysters in the east end of Long Island. And I believe fully in what they're doing. That's a different system. That is not using antibiotics. That is not inputting foods that comes from wild stocks. There's a difference to them. So we need to kind of dive into nuance as well. No, absolutely. And I think it's definitely not one size fits all. Correct. And thing. And I think we have to be careful about that. And the, and the EO and this, and this bill specifically are, you know, open ocean net pen aquaculture in federal waters and being able to have more development of that and hopefully more alignment around what roles the state plays, the Coast Guard and others and how we all talk, speak, you know, together to be able to make sure that these things are done properly. Stephen Gunther asks us, how do we go about educating the public about sustainable production of seafood and its importance in human nutrition? and debunk the myth that wild is healthier? Todd, I feel like you addressed that already a little bit. It's a great question. Uh, one that I spent several years trying to, I mean, really over the last couple of years was really to educate chefs and um, distributors about the benefits of aquaculture. And, you know, you could look at this from a scientific perspective and you can get uh, tissues analyzed from wild versus aquaculture, um, looking at the contaminants. So you can say which one has more, which one has less. Um, a lot of wild feed comes into aquaculture. So a lot of that will play with aquaculture from wild. Um, it's, uh, it, it's a really tough question to, at, to answer, but really it is about, um, you know, just more education, um, leveraging the, the good work that you know, seafood nutrition partnership. I keep going back to them because well, we and and the feed companies because there's also and excuse me for interrupting, but Biomar, Corbion's Algae Prime, where you're taking sustainable materials. You know, essentially the use of a recycled material from beet cane sugar production and turning it into a algae rich powder that then can be put into these into these diets and then you're really reducing what that fish and fish out ratio is if any at all and we see like mcfarland trout where they are using black soldier flies and other inputs so they've completely eliminated the need for any wild marine ingredients so i think it's it's getting there and i think the nutrition only goes up with that it's that commitment to those inputs, but you have to pay for them. So to Josh's point, the truth of the matter is, is that you've got to be willing to have that inclusion higher and there's going to be a cost for that, right? So just because your fish in fish out ratio is, is lower doesn't necessarily mean that you've added any sort of nutrition back in 
to the fish. And I think that's all coming. And S and P is definitely, is definitely a part of that. We have another um, question from Zach Ding. He says, how can aquaculture certifications like ASC, BAP, et cetera, lead industry sustainability and responsibility? So new methods of auditing, better standards, you know, how can we make that work better? And I'll leave it to you, Todd, because I think we've, we've frozen on Josh here as he's driving. Well, I think, um, when when I was in working with retail, so retail is a different animal than say restaurants are. Most retail is going to require a BAP certification of at least two star or higher. Um, they are already adopting those certification systems, um, and for the most part, uh, most of the retail um, the retail outlets out there do require some sort of certification for that. Josh just keeps bouncing in and out. Um, <laughs> So um, I, I think that, you know, we need to, they need to keep working on their standards to bring the standards higher, you know, requiring less fish meal um, as we develop the new technologies in fish meal. I mean, they are very expensive right now. They're just not cheap. Uh, it's an extremely expensive um, additive to, to feed right now, but that will come down over time. Uh, I'm looking forward to the day that that does, but um, I hope I, hopefully I answered the, the, the question. Yeah, I think I think definitely, and I think that we can. Maybe there will be um, auditing that will be stronger, especially as these systems are being built out. That I think will be important because the th the type of thing that's a single once a year or once every three years desk site assessment, I think is probably not going to be the way, at least initially, for us to be collaborating, working together, and making sure that whichever one of those trial projects is that they're being done um, in collaboration, yeah. right? Um, so we have another question, hopefully we'll get Josh back in here from Scotland Dally says the bulk of NOAA fisheries budget, not, uh, greater than 97% goes to managing and protecting wild marine resources, less than 3% goes into aquaculture research and development. Shouldn't we push for change there? And I can tell you that the bill actually has that in there. So the good news is, is that um, as I understand it, and and certainly Margaret and the group, uh, uh, Kim can jump in here. Um, I believe the number's $300 million is specifically going to be to work in these systems. And I don't know if you, and this is all under the bill, and I don't know if you've heard a different number. Todd? No, sorry. Um <laughs> Uh, I have not heard a different number. That number is going to have to change, um, especially if they have some sort of board of directors and a specific office within NOAA that's going to be managing uh, aquaculture. That is going to significantly have to shift. Now, does that mean that there's going to be less money towards wild and so uh, at detriment to the wild? I, I don't know the answer to that question, but um, without a doubt, there will need to be um, you know certification systems, auditing, um, regulatory environment uh, in place uh, with NOAA that's, um, you know, it's going to, it's going to have to, it's going to take money. Yeah. And Gracie White. So Gracie White asks, um, I'm reminded of what Kim from Aquarium of the Pacific was saying on the previous webinar that we'll never know everything and no system will ever be perfect. Uh, but at some point we need to accept that we know enough and that our tech is good enough. Um, how would you both define good enough? And I guess you're going to have to speak on behalf of Bones because we may have lost him for good here. <laughs> Well, good enough. Uh, I mean, we're, I, there's a lot of work to be done in aquaculture. I mean, nobody's perfect. Um, I learned a ton about uh, land-based systems because that's uh, we were raceway systems in, in Idaho. And, you know, a lot of work needs to be done. Um, but we are producing, you know, a sustainable trout. Uh, we were producing a sustainable trout, or I was working with the company. Um, but uh, there were systems in place to minimize the environmental impact, uh, being land-based, we were able to recover, uh, the wastes from the raceways and use them in regenerative ways. Um, you know, we're getting to that point where, um, I don't, we're not good enough, but we're, because there's a lot of technology and a lot of exciting things that are coming out there to help us minimize our impact on the environment. Mm -hmm. Um, but if we don't start somewhere and, and learn from our mistakes, I mean, that's just how we have to do it. Yeah, and I think that, um, again, one of the reasons why I wanted to get both of you in on this conversation was what you've talked about in terms of being contributive. And there are a lot of opportunities, especially I always think about how if we fund something from the outset with that intention in the budget, 
then we can more easily put that forward. It, usually if it all gets spent as we're growing or building the systems, we can't do that, right? But if it's if it's that line item, whether it's for marketing, whether it's for whether it's for this offset program, that we keep that what ends up happening is that language stays in our heads as we're working through all of our other practices, right? Um, so we have, um, so good enough is probably now, but with the right voices in the room is basically what you're both saying. Um, and so Mary, Mary Larkin also asks what concerns could technological innovations directly adjust? So you just mentioned waste mitigation, um, ensuring that the farm is healthy, that they're not transmitting disease to wild stocks. I think you actually already have, it, have mentioned some of those. And there are certainly some of those innovations that are already things like sea lice nets and, um, uh, you know, other multi-tropic systems that are on the farm that can actually help. So if the concessions, this isn't for deep ocean, but certainly we can start to use some of those things like planting seaweed alongside of our fin fish, um, right, production so that we can start to have some type of regenerative um, aquaculture that's part of that system. That can help as well. Absolutely. Uh, technological advances in water filtration, waste capture, uh, feed innovations is a big one. Um, I mean, you can, the list goes on and on. I mean, trophic uh, um, uh, farming you know, various species alongside, um, you know, say salmon farms, uh, oysters and seaweed can help reduce uh, some of the, um, the issues. Um, without a doubt, there'll be a lot of innovations that are, that are coming out to, to be able to support that. And Bones is back with us. We were just starting to talk about, um, no, it's totally fine. Listen, right, yeah. I, I have seen, I've seen so many of these where, I mean, I, I saw Bill Gates on one and he actually didn't have good internet service. It kept doing that like freezing thing. And I thought, and it was on NBC news. And I thought if this is happening at his house in front of his fireplace and he's not getting good internet service, we all get a hall pass on having the, the frozen, uh, you know, moment on zoom, Thank but you. Thank but you. we were. But um, our next question is from John Constantino, and he says, "Oyster aquaculture is a system that is fantastic for the environment, but one of the biggest issues is the oyster industry is the lack of ability to innovate. Tech is almost non-existent, and things like red tide disease, algal blooms, and freezes constantly cause issues. How do you propose a crop like oysters with such a slim margin to drive innovation? It's a good point. I mean, we need people to eat more oysters, probably." Yeah. 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 I mean, I guess one question is, is the, I mean, you can only get the oysters to grow so fast if you're, if you're culturing them in open ocean conditions, because then you are dependent upon the, the temperatures, the, any of the, the trophic profiles that are there. But it could also be that you use a multi-layer approach where your costs go down because you're growing algae on top of it, as well as oysters, as well as. And so at that point, you're not relying on revenues only from oysters. And so the innovation comes from the, the multi-layered aquaculture approach, and I'm, there's a better name for it than forgetting, than just trying to say, how do we get this one species to grow faster, better, better? I am such a fan of this because, you know, in most countries, when you have a concession, it's only to farm one thing. So the thought of this multi-tropic system already being embedded into a concession, I think is significantly important. So even if Quarry Arctic, who I work with, this unbelievable sustainable salmon company in the Arctic Circle, even if we wanted to start to try to cultivate some of that farm, the concession doesn't yet cover that. So it's, it's exceptionally difficult. One thing we were talking about was funding. Um, we had gotten a question about funding and I threw it out to Kim Thompson, who's with Aquarium of the Pacific, because there needed to be more 3% um, of funding is of NOAA's budget is towards aquaculture. And um, Kim says $60 million is being um, set aside for the fiscal year 2021, 65 million for 2022, 70 million for 2023, 75 million for 2024 and 80 million for the fiscal year 2025. That's the total NOAA budget. And, um, and that is everything um, that's in the draft stage. And that's everything for all that's multi-trophic for all systems, she said. So hopefully there's, there's room in there for. That's, that's what's being set aside by NOAA to, to do. Manage. That's their entire budget to to provide management to i mean what are the, what are they doing with that money i'd just be curious 
Yeah. So I, so it's, it's their entire budget. So we've talked about already, whether it's aquaculture, whether it's fishery management, um, all of their investments, that's their budget in its entirety. So as we grow aquaculture, I mean, I know for sure that the bill had some designated funds in it uh, to be able to help with oversight and to help streamline systems. And so I guess uh, TBD on that. How, how, what was the total again? Sorry. Uh, well, for 2021, it's 60 million. And okay. that's just to put that to put that in perspective, and I won't get into politics, but the current administration have given twenty uh, sorry uh, eighty six billion dollars of subsidies to the farming industry to not farm in the economic crisis, the the, the trade differences we're having with China. There is a huge huge investment going into land based farming, not to farm. So why would we not be investing more into sustainable aquaculture practices to farm? That's a question I would ask. Yeah, and I think that's the whole thing. Now we are we are out of time, but this is what I want to hopefully get from the two of you. We know that we need these voices and we need to all come to the table and have these kinds of dialogue. I know that um, the team from NOAA, when we had them on last week, uh, Kim Thompson with Aquarium of the Pacific and others all want to create this stakeholder conversation where just I think these types of things need to be considered. We know that aquaculture has a place in this space, we know that we have great, um, we have to have great fishery management. We have to look at that hatchery system. We have to look at the dams, the rivers, what the impacts are there, and hopefully be investing in this system so that we get recovery and be able to really start to grow wild stocks in a sustainable way. And the, and whenever I wrap this up, I always say, you know, done poorly, aquaculture can damage ecosystems, sensitive ecosystems that can disrupt communities. It can pose a threat to human health, but done well, I think that we know that if it's done well with all of the technologies, all of this forward thinking of the future, it can be a new food system for us that can build in terms of its equal ecologically, it can create economic and social good. And there are efforts being made in that and all of us need to keep our voice in the room so that we can have a balance between our wild caught, as Josh and Todd have said, and our sustainably reared fish in U.S. waters, especially at a time especially at a time when we're looking at needing to fill these food deserts, needing to get nutritious, delicious seafood out into this expanse in order to level this playing field of food injustice and all in an effort to create this curiosity, this innovation around a sustainable solution. So I thank you both for joining me. I really appreciate it. I'm looking forward to aligning and finding other ways in which we can work together because I think that Josh, honestly, artificial, Todd, the work that you were doing and in, 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 um, your offset systems, all of these things are all pieces that need to come into what we need in fish and seafood, in U.S. fish and seafood as we grow. So thank you. You should tune in next week because we're going to actually talk to two people that are investing a significant amount in aquaculture, whole oceans and emergent holdings, the new fund, Varuna Capital, all of which are looking at investing in sustainable aquaculture systems. And they're going to give us a sense of what this means, what this looks like, and how we can really build on these conversations and systems that we've talked about in terms of sustainability. Thank you both very much. Appreciate you. Thanks for, thanks for letting us take the car ride with you, Bones. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hope that we'll be able to keep in touch and talk soon. Take care, uh, everybody. Bye-bye. Right. Thank you.